Hello again. Been a while since I've released a video, just been kind of personally busy and I guess more global events have uh, distracted a lot of people, myself included, but I had been working on this uh, video topic for a while. I did a lot of the reading, but just never got around to like really just working through it and making a video about it. So I've, it kind of started when I would see people posting stuff about like Magnus Hirschfeld and like all the trans stuff and linking that to Jews. I was initially going to try just to read about like the trans issue, but as I was doing like a lot of reading on the topic, I kind of figured I would just do a general video about the sex revolution evolution in general, the history of it, stuff like that. I'm not necessarily going to go into like too deep into the theory of a lot of activists or scientists, psychologists, stuff. It's more just kind of like a broad overview and some of the well-known names and personalities behind the last, I guess, 200 years or so, maybe more like 150, of just studying sex, gender, politics, of that. Not gonna go too deep into feminism, I'll probably save that for a later video. But yeah, I just want to give like a good broad sweep of the history and the people involved, Gentile and Jew alike. And I think an appropriate place to start is the founding of sexuality itself as a field of study in the modern sense, which more or less occurred in mid-19th century Germany, where medical doctors, psychologists, and just lay people studied different aspects of what we would call sexuality, gender roles, gender, all that kind of stuff, with a more secular and scientific method point of view, as opposed to the earlier, I guess you'd just say religious outlook on anything outside of heterosexual marriage-based sex was kind of just sinful, and there wasn't really much more to discuss or research about it. In fact, even the terms like homosexual, heterosexual are fairly modern, recent terms. And so a field which was eventually dubbed sexology was born. And you can kind of pinpoint when this change took place. In Foucault's History of Sexuality, he points to Heinrich Kahn's work as the first of its kind to treat this subject as a field of study and, you know, write a scientific text about it. I didn't actually focus too much on Kahn's writings. I've kind of started my own research on a couple later figures. For example, Richard Von Kraft Ebbing, who a lot of people say is kind of the founder of sexology and was the first actually trained doctor to make the homosexual versus heterosexual distinction. And Tom Holland, the author of Dominion, which I definitely recommend to people, states that while Ebbing had a kind of distaste for homosexuality and saw it as a degenerate type of thing, he later on in life viewed it as something innate and supported decriminalization. And Holland actually credits this to the Christian view of monogamy and the dignity of the human person, and that that influenced Ebbing's views on seeing homosexuality as something innate and can really be changed and something just to accept and tolerate. I think even that's a little bit like of a strained take on Holland's part, but I just think the book is good and I just wanted to throw it in there. It covers mainly other topics not having to do with sexuality, but the main point being that Ebbing was someone who instilled in the scientific community this heterosexual homosexual dichotomy and even using those definitions was something new at the time. But in fact, he was even working on the work of two other earlier, I wouldn't even say sexologists, more just like activists and lay people in the realm of sexology, Carl Ulrichs and Carl Kurtbenny, and both of these men were advocates for homosexual rights and more or less wanted to use the scientific rationalist understanding of sexuality to further that goal. And both of them more or less around the same time coined terms for what we would call today homosexuals and I guess other sexual proclivities. Ulrichs coined the term earning, which among other descriptions was described as someone with a male body and a female soul. And even some of his writings and ideas were used later on to kind of elucidate the topic of transvestites, transsexuals, what we'd call modern day transgenders, stuff like that, but I'll get into that later. And while this term wasn't, didn't really catch on, also, although some of his work surrounding the term did, Kurt Benny coined the actual terms homosexual and heterosexual, which is still in use today, coining that term in 1869. And while Kurt Benny didn't have the same view of kind of like a sexual inversion that Ulrichs did, this kind of like feminine soul in a male body, both of them did see it as something innate, which was certainly not like a position a lot of people had back in those days, although it's certainly a mainstream position today. And so both men had their influence and impact on the field. Many people used Ulrichs ideas later on, especially English sexologists. So it was much more than just like classifications and 
terminology, and both made arguments for the decriminalization of homosexuality. Ulrich specifically kind of had this naturalistic argument that if something occurs in nature at all, it's natural, and if it's natural, it's good, and there's not really anything as like an unnatural sexuality if it has been practiced. Kind of like a, I guess an argument from nature, if you will, an early form of that, which a lot of people use today. Kurt Benny's approach was actually a little bit different than this, however. His approach was less an argument from nature, which he kind of rightly says could be a double-edged sword. A lot of things happen in nature that we wouldn't really call moral or good or acceptable in civil society. His argument is more kind of like a libertarian do-no-harm principle that as long as an action isn't doing any physical harm in a kind of a utilitarian sense, like Jeremy Bentham would argue, who actually was one of the first people to argue for decriminalization of homosexuality based on this argument. So he basically used like a utilitarian approach that, look, it didn't really harm anyone, and that's that. Also, Kurt Benny was not himself a homosexual, so that could also be another reason why he may have had some differences with Ulrich's position, various positions, and like, I guess they kind of had a falling out, but regardless, they were like two of the more vocal and well-known uh, advocates for decriminalization of homosexuality. But beyond these two, uh, there were others, like for Ferdinand Karsh, who used the earlier works of Heinrich Hosley, who wrote about um, Greek sexuality in kind of a positive manner, and Karsh took this and basically Ulrich used it to argue that uh, same-sex love and attraction was something natural and should be allowed for in the law. And he was pretty explicit in saying it was kind of a direct attack on quote-unquote false Christianity and Torian sexual ethic, and that kind of the job of these scientists was to pioneer truth and new norms, stuff like that. And he also was later came out as a homosexual. So it was kind of a pretty common thing, actually, that a lot of these, especially like the sexologists who were more positive on homosexuality, were themselves homosexual. Ulrichs, Karsh, and Hirschfeld, who we'll talk about later on, uh, all three pretty good examples of this. And it makes sense that if someone was a homosexual or had these tendencies that they might have their work kind of reflect their own personal predicament, if you will, which kind of relates to the JQ in a certain sense because a lot of people would say, well, a lot of these sexologists were Jews, which is true to an extent. There's definitely disproportionate Jewish representation among sexologists, and that according to like a Kevin McDonald-esque view, they might group evolutionary strategy reason, want to like liberalize sexual ethics, maybe something more akin to like E. Michael Jones or something. But I think that doesn't really fit the bill here. In fact, I was reading an article and it basically did talk about how Jews were overrepresented in sexology, but that their Jewishness didn't really seem to have much to do with anything, especially because some Jews were more conservative, as we'll see, and and others like Hirschfeld were liberal, but I mean, Hirschfeld was a homosexual. And the article basically explained it away like a lot of other explanations of the similar phenomenon that we see that Jews were just overrepresented in the medical field, but certain jobs were kind of more closed off to Jews, but sexology was like a new field of study, so Jews were not so much barred into that. It was seen as kind of like dirty science, if you will. So just something to note there. And here's just like a quick list of some of the other notable homosexual sexologists throughout the period. But moving on to some more, I guess you'd say conservative sexologists and their response responses to this type of thinking by Ulrich. Albert Moll and Iwan Bloch, I think that's how you pronounce it, were two Jewish sexologists who thought of homosexuality as something not innate and brought about by circumstance and trauma. And while they used his terminology and classification system, they didn't really see it as this natural, quote-unquote, natural thing, and if anything was a literal degenerate act linking it with the degeneration theory that was popular at the time. And Ebbing agreed with this assessment as well, seeing homosexuality as kind of a pathological disturbance. And they couldn't really grasp Hosley's understanding of Greek agape love as this kind of true form of love that surpasses Darwinistic need to reproduce in the minds of people like Ebbing and Maul at the time, before they later kind of changed their views anyway. They didn't, they couldn't understand that humans 
like without a reproductive end could really like be in love and how it could be like a natural thing for I don't know, like two gay dudes to love each other really in like a in any kind of real sense beyond just kind of banal carnality if that's even the right word to use so they rejected the writings of people like Hosley who Karsh used to justify homosexuality and just saw it as kind of like base behavior and for a brief period of time it did seem like this conservative view was the kind of standard view of sexology because people like Ebbing especially Ebbing was the premier sexologist of the day much more than Ulrichs who was more or less just an activist he wasn't a trained physician or anything like that and these more conservative sexologists saw things like homosexuality bestiality and onanism which what they referred to as uh, modern day masturbation as forms of degeneracy and literally being a part of degeneration theory which was first originated with Auguste Morel as a way to explain how the modern industrial period was influencing society and this was taken up by the Jewish Zionist thinker Max Nordau and also an Italian Jew Lombroso and they just further used Morel's idea to explain in their view certain degenerate behaviors while not explicitly referring to sexuality so much at least that wasn't like their main point of interest but just the whole degeneration theory in general could be applied to various aspects of society including sexuality now this degeneration theory was criticized by Iwan or Ivan Bloch who was like a Jewish sexologist but he was pretty moderate and criticized Ebbing and Maul overall he was a moderate uh, figure um, he wasn't for the illegality of homosexual acts but he still retained some aspects of thinking it was perverse. He was kind of like in between Paul and Ebbing on one hand and a Hirschfeld and Ulrich on the other, kind of showing a gradation there. But I think certainly he was not a progressive sexologist in any meaningful sense, as noted by the more modern uh, I believe he just died actually recently, sexologist Volkmar Sigish. He had criticisms for both Bloch and Maul, but had praise for Hirschfeld in the sense that Hirschfeld's views kind of bled out into his politics and he saw them all as one thing, whereas Bloch and Maul were more just into like the pure science of their field. And even, I didn't know this actually until recently, Sigish writes about how Maul was pretty much till the end like a pretty bitter rival of Hirschfeld and was what the reason why Hirschfeld didn't get a position in France in his exile. Maul apparently had written a letter to higher ups in the French psychology community denouncing Hirschfeld and basically Maul was just critical of Hirschfeld's survey data, his methods, and generally thought that, I guess till the end of his day, thought that homosexuality was something that could be cured and just was generally more conservative on these issues and just didn't see Hirschfeld as very correct in his methods and even kind of scoffed at the idea that Hirschfeld left Germany because of the persecution of Jews so I actually didn't know that until recently so I'm going to link that article for sure but something to be of note and just going on a tangent because I literally just realized this that Volkmar Sigish he definitely is not a Jewish sexologist and or was not um, and I guess he was the guy who coined the term cis but anyway uh, I was just looking him up more and I guess the Occidental Observer which I'm sure everyone is familiar with has a little section on Jewish sexology and I find it odd that in their like conclusion they call sexology a Jewish thing kind of like psychoanalysis but not so much but that they accuse the Jewish sexologists of having like a Talmudic abstraction away from themes of degeneration that is totally not what I've researched or found to be the case and Sigish would himself disagree so I just find that kind of odd if uh, that might be of some use to someone but regardless of all that and getting back on track the general momentum of sexology did eventually trend towards like a progressive viewpoint and even people like Ebbing and Bloch at the end of their kind of careers and lives did seek the decriminalization of homosexuality in an effort led by Hirschfeld I believe Maul also signed on to this but I think he had some disagreements and like later came to denounce it. I'm not too sure. You can read uh, Sigish for that, but regardless, as history has borne out, it's it definitely turned into a more liberal profession. And speaking of more like liberal, progressive type sexologists, the English, uh, the famous English sexologists who, as earlier said, were influenced a lot by Ulrichs, were all pretty much liberal on the subject. People like Ed Carpenter, Pavlock Ellis, John Simmons. Interestingly enough, all of them were influenced by the American poet Walt Whitman, who I think history has shown was like a pretty gay dude. In 1897, both Ellis and Simmons 
wrote a book called Sexual Inversion, which covered the area of homosexuality. They were involved in the Iranian movement. I'm not sure I pronounced that, but uh, it was basically like an early homosexual society, I guess, for lack of a better description. Carpenter was the first head of the British Society for the Study of Sex Psychology, which was inspired by Hirschfeld's scientific humanitarian community. And the first World League for Sexual Reform in 1928 had people like Hirschfeld, but also Havelock Ellis on as honorary presidents. So we're definitely pretty prominent in their own right, but from my reading it seemed like Ellis had the most profound impact among the English sexologists. According to The Modernization of Sex by Paul Robinson, Havelock Ellis is actually the founder or the father of the modern sexual ethos as opposed to Freud, and he compares him to people like Max Weber and Einstein and their respective fields. He mentions sexual inversion, which tries to argue for an innate homosexuality, as opposed to Freud and Ebbing proposed an idea of a sexual continuum rather than some kind of sexual normality, pro-masturbation, which was pretty controversial at the time, and clashed with the psychoanalytic view of Freud that it was something kind of neurotic that should be given up, believed that women had their own sexual desires and were sexual beings in their own right Right? not just like carriers of babies. Again, it all seems fairly modern and easy to digest to people today, but back in the day, obviously controversial. And lastly, was a proponent of trial marriages and even open marriages, which was even before Margaret Mead's time, so that was pretty revolutionary. He also coined the term Ianism to basically refer to what we would call today transvestites, which was another term coined by Hirschfeld uh, around the same period, you know, essentially referring to cross jesters. But this kind of, uh, obviously the act of cross-dressing had been a historical cultural phenomenon since antiquity. Various sexologists from Kraft Ebbing to Maul, Hughes, and others I mean, gave certain words to this idea, whether it be the Scythian steppe peoples or the people in the Americas during the Spanish colonization. You see today in various cultures, like in India, uh, various names was given to them. Ellis coined the term Ianism, referring to Chevalier de Aon, who kind of lived alternatively as a man and a woman. There was kind of a debate among Ellis and Hirschfeld, who were, I guess, like the latter two in the the late 19th, early 20th century to write about this phenomenon, Ellis did seem to have more of a ingrained actual deeper meaning of the word Ianism versus Hirschfeld's transvestism. Ellis seemed to think it was something more innate and coming even like before childhood, anything like that. Just something innate in someone's like person to want to be the other gender and objected to some of Hirschfeld's language like transvestism and Hirschfeld's phrase impulse of disguise because to Ellis it was not this disguise, it was really being someone's true self. So something that, you know, obviously modern transgenderism advocates would advocate for. And not saying Hirschfeld was against that, obviously Hirschfeld later on really carried the main thrust of like not only what we would call today trans ideology, but just like sexual ethics in general. He definitely became the powerhouse, especially in continental Europe, probably even overshadowed people in the Anglosphere. However, I did just want to remark that they had that disagreement. Regardless, both influenced later people like Harry Benjamin, Caldwell, etc. in the United States. And frankly, while we're on the topic, all four of these names I've just mentioned were definitely influenced by Ulrichs, as I've previously mentioned, but you can read about the third sex theory of Carl Ulrichs by Hubert Kennedy, where he shows Ulrichs uses this kind of language that a lot of people hear today of a female soul trapped in a man's body, stuff like that. And I mean, obviously, every scholar is a scholar in their own right, but just always good to show some kind of chains or links to the past. But anyways, focusing more on Hirschfeld and just the broader sexual liberal milieu at the time, a lot of sex reform organizations and groups were propping up, oftentimes led by Hirschfeld, or with him at least in like a high position. Probably his most famous was the Institute for Sexual Science, or Institute for Sexology, I don't know the direct translation from the German. And that's where like the Nazis burned all those books from that famous picture. Anyways, he had a yearbook of sexual intermediaries, which kind of showcased different people with different, I mean, I guess it mainly focused on hermaphrodites. I'm not exactly sure to be honest, but frankly, a lot of this sexual science, especially about like different genders and this kind of like gender bending stuff, a lot of it did just come from the fact that people are born hermaphrodites sometimes. And you know, the fact that in history, a lot of people cross-dressed, which is something we'll talk about later with John Money as well. He worked with Eugene Steinek, who was another Jew, who kind of was the first to, I'm not sure if he like synthesized the, the hormones, but was kind of the first to acknowledge the sex hormones 
hormones of estrogen and testosterone, IDing them as sex hormones and like possible uses. And for sure, the first sex change surgeries did happen under Hirschfeld's watch at the Institute for Sexual Science. And he wasn't exactly super gung ho about, oh, we're just going to give surgery to everyone who asks, but he did kind of use the apologetic that some people use today that, well, these people are going to commit suicide if they don't have these surgeries. And so some of these first surgeons were Jews around like half from what I could tell, but others were just Gentile Germans, like Erwin Gorbrand, who later worked under the Nazis at a camp, so he definitely wasn't Jewish, and Kurt Varner Cross, I don't know how to pronounce that. But also you have Jews like Ludwig Levy Lenz, so definitely just a confluence of Gentiles and Jews. But yeah, at the end of the day, I wouldn't necessarily say that a lot of the Spurgs who talk about Hirschfeld are completely wrong on this. I mean, they are correct that he was pretty big on this trans issue and sexual liberalism in general. Uh, Hitler referred to him as like the most dangerous Jew in Germany. But regardless, by the time the Nazis came to power and World War II, it kind of just put a halt to a lot of this kind of stuff. And you don't really see a resurgence of this kind of thing until the post-World War II era. And we can go more to the United States to take a look at that. The cultural milieu for uh, the US, even before World War II, like during the 1920s, kind of like the flapper girl era for the depression before world war ii there was this growth of a lot of economic activity urbanization big cities parties all that kind of stuff you would see in like boardwalk empire and stuff in this kind of climate a lot of new literature and kind of like mores came to be that were kind of opposed to the victorian uh, sexual ethic uh you can read about that in rebellion against victorianism but people like escott fitzgerald Ezra Pound, Faulkner, others uh, being published who wrote about casual sex, drinking, smoking, just kind of living that life of a, you know, free sex kind of bachelor. More scientific literature was being published, like Margaret Mead, who I mentioned earlier, her coming of age in Samoa, that kind of showed a different way to be sexually. And even some medical texts and writers at the time wrote about how it was medically improper to categorize anyone as fully man or fully woman, and how every person is really bisexual at their core. You can see this in figures like George Henry and Clifford A. Wright. There was some focus on the coldness of marriages. Robert and Helen Lynn's uh, study on Milltown. There was kind of this burgeoning sexual ethic in the U.S. as well. Always kind of lagging a bit behind Europe probably, but uh, regardless, that was the case. Obviously during the Depression and World War II, there was just like other things going on, but post-World War II, the study of sex scientifically also was a thing in the US with Alfred Kinsey, considered the great statistician of sex, promoted sexual tolerance and variety, thought sexual deviance was more of like a common thing, also promoted an idea of a spectrum, weirdly normalized bestiality and animal companions, but we don't have to get into that. He criticized some of Freud's views on masturbation particularly, but uh, he just didn't really buy into this whole pathological idea um, obviously pro-homosexuality, defended premarital sex, generally anti-religion, much like earlier sexologists kind of thought that religion, if anything, was stifling, and that the previous Victorian sexuality was really like something out of uh, Christianity, originally Judaism and then Christianity, but because of the post-Christian world, cultural mores were changing, and just generally helped with the like liberalization of sex in America. Everyone has heard of the Kinsey scale, stuff like that. So yeah, pretty prominent American scientists in this field and was, along with John Money, who I'll talk about later, brought up as a pretty strict Christian, and sometimes you'll see that with certain types of people. Same thing with Hugh Hefner, just kind of an interesting little anecdote there. The birth control pill was created in a joint venture between Rock and Pincus, a Catholic and a Jew. Margaret Sanger's Planned Parenthood was operating. The Rockefeller Foundation was not only financing Kinsey, but later teams like William Masters in Virginia Johnson, who kind of picked up the mantle that Kinsey left when he died, as well as financing and funding early sex education, which more or less was just in a response to World War One soldiers getting a bunch of STDs, but regardless, all that stuff put sexuality more on the map as something to be studied and what have you. This emphasis on sex 
bleeds out into the culture and you start seeing softcore and eventually hardcore pornography. The first big example is probably Playboy from Hugh Hefner, which in later years is followed by people like Larry Flint, Bob Guccione with their own versions of that. There had always been stag films, kind of shown under the radar, but more modern hardcore stuff came out later, first introduced by Scandinavian filmmakers and magazine publishers. And Ruben Sturman was a Jewish businessman who made his way into this kind of scene by distributing this European porn in the United States. But definitely in the beginning, a lot of it was produced in Europe, uh, places like Sweden, Denmark, West Germany. A lot of weird sexual groups form, like swingers clubs, the Sexual Freedom League, started by Jeff Poland and Leo Koch, and from what I could tell, they seem to be Gentile, as well as the people who started various swingers clubs. Jews like uh, Ralph Ginsburg and Al Goldstein push the envelope a lot and get in trouble with the law over obscenity laws. Deep Throat is like a really big popular success, first big porno, creates a lot of waves, directed by an Italian dude, has a lot of connections with the mob apparently. Second wave feminism becomes really prominent, but I'll probably do a video on that separately, so I just won't get into that. Although there's some kind of interesting interactions between feminists and this kind of new sexual culture, but regardless, gay rights activism as well. The first official gay rights org was founded by Henry Gerber in the 20s, and he was an immigrant from Bavaria. I'm not sure if he was Jewish or not, but regardless, his org didn't last too long. And I guess the real first organization for gay rights that started with any staying power was the Mattachine Society, which was founded by Harry Hay, this kind of weird Englishman, but anyway, Gentile for sure. And the Daughters of Billets, I think it's pronounced, was also founded around the same time by Del Martin and Phyllis Leon, two lesbo chicks. So the those were some of the first groups, but in terms of individuals, the book The Gay Revolution talks about Frank Kameny and Barbara Giddings as two really foundational leaders of the gay rights movement. Uh, Kameny's Jewish, Giddings was a Gentile, and did their work a lot in like the 50s and 60s. Their activism did help get homosexuality removed from the DSM in 1973. They used data from Kinsey's Institute and also a report by Evelyn Hooker that demonstrated in that report at least that gay men and straight men were both psychologically sound, but their real main accomplishment was getting a medical doctor to advocate for them, who they had to dress him up in a disguise, I guess, because it was too embarrassing for him or something. But his name was John Fryer, and I mean, I couldn't find anything about him Jew-wise. But most definitely a lot of the actual psychologists and physicians who made the ultimate decision were Jewish. People like Judd Marmer and Spitzer. Again, I would just chalk this up to there being a lot of Jewish psychologists and doctors in general. And also, it wasn't necessarily like an advocation of homosexuality. All it was was this technical definition that it doesn't reach the standards of being a psychological disorder. And I mean, Spitzer even said that he wasn't necessarily like praising it or saying it was as good as home heterosexuality, just that it doesn't necessarily belong in the DSM. Also, this happened after the Stonewall riots and the first gay pride parade part organized by Morris Knight, another activist. And there was just like a lot of grassroots gay rights stuff going on. It's kind of hard to pin all of it on certain individuals. There were numerous gay rights orgs and magazines and all this kind of stuff. It's pretty hard to say all of it for the sake of time, as well as various court cases, even up until fairly recently, that have a lot to do with gay rights and stuff. A lot of them weirdly presided over by Anthony Kennedy, who is an Irish Catholic. At least he's the one who gave the majority opinion or whatever. And speaking of gay rights, obviously trans stuff was going on even way back in like the 70s. But to get to that kind of needs to dovetail into a discussion about gender. And to get to that, I want to finally bring up John Money, who was a New Zealand born psychologist who eventually moved to the US, born to a Puritan type family, much like Hefner, and also was a sexual minority, much like Hirschfeld. So kind of a double whammy there. His first major work was an examination of some basic sexual concepts concepts, the evidence of human hermaphroditism, which argued that one's gender identity, a term that Money himself came up with, was more shaped by one's early life experiences rather than their chromosomal sex or what gonads they had, basing this on his study of an experience with intersex people. And he wasn't the first to really deal with intersex people in America. There were people like Hugh Hampton Young and Albert Ellis, who seemed to agree with Money that a hermaphrodite's gender identity came to be constructed via upbringing, 
Again, so far, these type of studies mainly just dealt with hermaphrodites. They weren't really extrapolating at this point onto the wider populace. And Albert Ellis was a more contemporary of money Jewish sexologist guy. But Hugh Hampton Young was an earlier American Gentile surgeon who was the head of genitourinary surgery at John Hopkins in 1897, and Hopkins will be important later on with money as well in this field. And Young, during this time, pioneered a lot of genital reconstructive procedures that were later put to use for more modern-day trans surgeries, but his main goal was just to give, quote-unquote, the right set of genitalia to problem cases, basically people who were hermaphrodites, but even in doing that, he kind of had to make certain assumptions about what someone's gender or sex really was because it wasn't always clear with intersex people. As you can see, this topic gets really confusing really fast. So yeah, but anyways, you also have others like Alexander Kawadias, a Greek, but I assume he wrote primarily in English, who wrote about there not being an absolute male nor absolute female, and every male possesses latent female features and vice versa, taking this view also from his work with hermaphroditism. So just some precursors to money in that sense. Kind of his background leading up to his work in the transgender phenomenon, and his methods in terms of how to treat intersex individuals became the main paradigm during the 1970s. But even beyond that, just generally as a sexologist, he was quite renowned in other aspects that I just want to highlight real quick, as a lot of his ideas and theories formed the general culture. He was considered kind of a sex guru, offering his advice in Playboy magazines. He was a star witness at the Deep Throat trial, was very pro-sex. He wrote about wanting a sexual revolution in which there would be dedicated sex channels to teach people and show people all about sex, and advocated early childhood exposure to sex, sex rehearsals, early sex set, all that kind of stuff. Came up with the idea of love maps, which basically states that a person's sexual proclivities emerge from early adolescence, childhood, and arise from a certain plasticity that gets molded early on in life. Probably not doing it justice, but something like that. Generally just kind of had an idea of like a fluidity among gender, identity, sexuality, all that kind of stuff that we're pretty accustomed to in the modern age. His book, Man and Woman, Boy and Girl, co-authored with Anka Earhart, made a lot of waves at the time and was compared to other works from Ellis, Freud, Ebbing, people like that, and in part discuss the famous David Raymer case, which I'll get into a little bit. So yeah, definitely his effects were very broad, but if I want to talk about his role in just the specific niche of the transgender movement, I'm going to want to bring up some other people who are involved as well to get a fuller picture. So to start out with, in the 40s and 50s, there was the Langley Porter Clinic started by Carl Bowman. And Bowman was a researcher on divergent sexuality, and he was associated with Kinsey. And through them, they came into contact with various, I guess you would call them transgender now, but just people who cross-dressed, notably Virginia Prince, who came to be like a pretty well-known advocate for transgenders. Also, Harry Benjamin was introduced to a lot of people through this clinic as well. So it was just kind of like an early clinic for people to discuss these kind of topics. And while they didn't do any surgeries at the time because they thought that it would just lead to lawsuits and stuff, on the side, Benjamin, who is like the half-Jewish guy who worked with Hirschfeld, he did recommend some people to go to a guy named Elmer Belt, who I couldn't confirm or deny he was Jewish, I don't think he was, who did some of the surgeries, and I'm pretty sure he did the first surgeries in the States, so that was like in the 50s. A male to female transgender named Christine Jorgensen, she, I'll just say she, came into prominence in the 50s as well and kind of had this like publicized story in the media and she actually had her, I guess like the first like well-known sex change during this period and she actually had to go to Copenhagen where Christian Hamburger, a Danish surgeon, did the whole operation from male to female and although he's seldom talked about, he was pretty big in the whole pioneering field of how to treat transsexuals, along with Benjamin who had been consulting with Jorgensen previously before her trip. And so this story just greatly increased the presence of this kind of phenomenon in the media and it was kind of a media storm. The term transsexual was initially coined by Dr. David Caldwell in 1949 and later popularized by Benjamin in his book, The Transsexual Phenomenon. However, while Caldwell wasn't really like a fan of surgery itself and more just wanted to create a tolerant atmosphere in society for transvestites, 
Benjamin was more open to that and more or less agreed with the Danish doctors about Christine Jorgensen's predicament. But of course, they weren't just super gung-ho in recommending it to everyone. It was obviously a last resort kind of thing. And a lot of this kind of thinking was reminiscent of Ulrich's earlier thinking on a female soul and a male body, which Benjamin explicitly borrows, but other thinkers like Caldwell and Hamburger also more or less agree with. And at the end of the day, they're dealing with people who are having these feelings, whether one may think about them, so they're kind of having to deal with these issues. Obviously, they're not just like making stuff up out of total thin air. I mean, no one would do this unless they had some kind of desire to do this no matter what you think about it there was certainly people with these issues and scientists when they hear and see like new things they want to diagnose it and treat it etc and this might be really applicable to Michael Dillon, a doctor in the UK who ended up being a female to male transsexual, uh, also wrote on this in the 40s and basically advocated surgery even before some of the publications from Caldwell and Benjamin. And Margaret Mead's view of sex roles and others had that similar idea that a lot of what we think of as masculine feminine is just based on social upbringing and social learning, socialization, that also kind of like fed into these concepts of the new view of gender and sex, which go on to influence money. But yeah, I can always delve deeper into some of the older researchers into this topic, but I want to turn my attention a bit to more of the activism side. I already brought up Virginia Prince, who started some of the first transgender organizations, notably the Foundation for Personality Expression and Transvestia, respectively. And incidentally, she seemed to have coined the term transgender role, which eventually became transgenderist. But she kind of had a different philosophy to that of people like Benjamin. She didn't really think surgery was necessary but she believed herself to be like a real woman just didn't think that surgery was necessary definitely just adding more to the confusion just a lot of different terms and viewpoints I actually think the term transgenderism at least had been in use in the 60s by John F. Olivan but anyway just like a lot of mysteries surrounding the etymology of a lot of these terms anyway but in terms of other activists, you have people like Reed Erickson, who funded a lot of the earlier transgender stuff. He, yeah, I guess he created the Erickson Educational Foundation, which like funded a lot of Harry Benjamin stuff and also helped establish transgender centers at John Hopkins and other colleges. Basically was the main funder for a lot of this early trans stuff. I looked it up. I, at first, I didn't think this dude or girl, whatever, was Jewish, but I guess they are half, so, or they were. I think they're dead now. So I guess that's like another half. Michelin Jew guy, girl, whatever. And other various trans organizations kind of sprouted up in the post-Stonewall era of the 70s. Labyrinth being one of them, Tao, and just various like intellectuals wrote on the topic. I mean, most of them being transgender activists, but just kind of wrote on it in academic language, what have you, in the uh, 80s and 90s. Definitely a lot of Jews, but a lot of non-Jews as well, at least from what their name suggests. Some of these people have Wikipedia pages and stuff, so you can look it up. But uh, you do also see like a decent amount of Jews who seem to be kind of against a lot of this transgender stuff as well, or at least critical of some of the methodologies. So while some doctors, notably Ira Pauly and Donald W. Hastings, were starting to warm up in the early 60s to normalizing transgender surgery, people like Robert Stoller, who's Jewish as opposed to the other two dudes, was actually pretty initially against transgender surgeries and his leadership role at the Gender Identity Research Clinic was more conservative, I guess you would say, in this specific kind of niche realm. It didn't perform nor recommend transgender surgery. And here in How Sex Changed 126, it says the clinic won its professional reputation for its attempts to get sissy boys and occasionally tomboy girls to behave in masculine, or in the case of girls, feminine ways. So essentially they were trying to instill in young boys and girls how to behave the correct way, essentially, how a normal person <laughs> would see it. And he worked with other Jews, Ralph Greenson. I'm pretty sure Richard Green is probably Jewish. I'm not sure though, but I confirmed that Greenson and Stoller are both Jews. And Stoller even complained that our society was moving too rapidly toward massive blurring of gender differences. And he got in some flack for that kind of thinking, even though it seems otherwise, he seems like a pretty like liberal, like kind of even progressive type guy, but just for that stance of firm gender roles and how women and men should be. He got some flack from transgender types and just like the feminist movement at large. In fact, Greenson more or less had the same opinion 
of transsexuals as did Charles W. Socarides, who I believe was a Greek psychoanalyst, but regardless, they both believed that more or less transsexualism was just like a severe type of homosexuality, and both thought transsexualism was in a sense their inner conflict with themselves, trying to like justify, or trying to come to terms with their homosexuality, but like so much so that they become the other sex, if that makes sense. But regardless, Socarides and uh, Greenson, to an extent, I believe also were interested in psychoanalysis, especially Socarides, who took a lot of influence from Freud. And a lot of psychoanalysts were actually some of the major critics of transsexualism. They kind of have like a murky view of homosexuality itself. I'm not gonna get into that too much, but in terms of transsexuality, I think a lot of psychoanalysts were pretty critical of the whole movement. And a lot of psychoanalysts, of course, were Jewish. For instance, Isidore Saviger was an early psychoanalyst right after Freud, who argued to effectively cure transvestism, transsexuality, kind of before Stoller and all that, but which is a good example of a psychoanalyst who was interested in doing that. You have people like Edward Sagarin, who while he was a pioneer in the gay rights movement, writing his magnum opus, The Homosexual in America, he became later critical of the gay rights movement. And even Frank Kameny, who was considered to be kind of moderate in the whole movement, called him out as being too conservative. I'll honestly give some background info, but he was also the reviewer of the John Money book that I mentioned earlier. And although he praised the book and that it would be a important text, it did have some disagreements with Money, which Money responded to. However, he had some really deep criticism of Benjamin's book, The Transsexual Phenomenon, chastising Benjamin for trying to create a favorable social atmosphere for these persons, meaning you know, transsexuals, and saw the whole medical enterprise of dealing with it as kind of inventing a disease and spreading into the media, which will affect impressionable people, which a lot of modern day critics kind of agree with, of the whole transgender movement. Another prominent Jewish critic of maybe not directly transgender ideology, but more of the ideology that Money, uh, John Money presented generally about sex gender roles and how that a lot of that is uh, cultural was Milton Diamond, who was a prominent critic of Money, specifically his, the famous David Raymer case in which someone who was circumcised had an accident and basically was raised as a girl through like basically John Money's advice, I guess you'd say. He was a critic of that kind Kind of approach. But regardless of any criticism, you know, Money was more or less the prime trans advocate of the 70s and criticized for this by the feminist anti-trans activist Janice Raymond in her book, The Transsexual Empire. Even more so than Benjamin, he was, especially in terms of the clinic, an advocate of transgender surgeries and stuff like that, ultimately believing it was the best course of action and basically was like the head of the clinic up until its closure. So that clinic eventually closed, but it did have an influence on the opening of other clinics. And while eventually the EEF, Erickson Foundation, eventually shut down in the 70s and that kind of like withered away, there was still this momentum and the, also Harry Benjamin and Reed Erickson had a falling out, but the Harry Benjamin Society came into being and was led by Paul Walker, who kind of took over where Harry Benjamin left off. The Hopkins Clinic at the end of the day never did too many surgeries, and in fact Europe was more of a center for transsexual surgeries than uh, Hopkins ever was. Uh, you can look at Georges Barreau, for example, who did a lot of surgeries in Casablanca, and eventually it became a more a decentralized thing. People started doing like private practices to offer sex changes. It was almost kind of seen as just like a money grab. For example, a prominent doctor, John Ronald Brown, he was a surgeon who did these transgender surgeries, uh, eventually had a murder conviction, just kind of became more decentralized more and more. In the 90s, more mainstream gay rights organizations hopped on the bandwagon of trans stuff and just generally I don't think there's just from what I can personally like I don't know tell there's not as much research into it as such anymore like laying the groundwork it's more just like activism and people who want to get surgeries and all that stuff so yeah kind of all jumbled up there but um I tried to give like a brief overview of like not even all but some of the more well-known names of this whole like kind of timeline. I think basically you'll find Jews kind of like in other topics I've covered, like disproportionately represented. It seems to me a bit more so in the trans stuff. I'm not sure why, but also a decent amount of the trans
trans criticism, I guess, or like modern gender ideology itself from people like Milton Diamond. I think a good dichotomy of this between two Jews is Dr. Norman Spack and Dr. Kenneth Zucker, who are both Jews, but have like pretty much polar opposite views on this kind of, this view of gender ideology, trans stuff, etc. So yeah, that's all I have to really say about that. I guess another thing to look at in the modern context is just some of the biggest funders of trans stuff. A lot of it isn't really particularly Jewish. Some of it is. You have the Arcus Foundation, Ford Foundation, Gale Foundation. Of those three, I didn't, I don't think they're really Jewish. But then like the next two kind of are. <laughs> the Evelyn and Walter Hawes Jr. Fund and the Open Society Foundations, obviously owned by George Soros or whatever. So definitely like a mix of Jewish Gentile philanthropy. If you look at certain countries who like first legalized gay marriage or legalized trans stuff, a lot of them tend to be like Northern European countries that don't really have many Jews. So I just don't think, I mean, obviously at the end of the day, I think it's more of like a European post-enlightenment, rationalistic, secular phenomenon, like a lot of stuff. If you read, I haven't read the whole thing, but if you read the transgender industrial complex, the writer, like every time a Jew is there, he'll say like the Jewish or he'll make sure the person is known as a Jew. But if he did the same thing with Europeans, like European Gentiles, he would have to for like every person, oh, the European Gentile, John Money, blah, blah, blah. And I mean, the fact of the matter is that essentially something that arose because of the enlightenment secularism, stuff like that, liberalism, etc. Definitely disproportionately Jewish, definitely plenty of prominent Gentiles, and from what I was talking about earlier, it doesn't seem like being Jewish has much to do with this kind of thing, besides like maybe like a scant feeling of like, oh, if we were persecuted once and trans people are persecuted, blah blah blah, but I think for the most part, a lot of it is people who are sexual minorities, and I do think there is something to be said about sexual minorities and the fact that just practically, if you can't have children, or you don't have children, and you have like a certain thing to, you know, quote unquote fight for, you're just going to be more active in that. Like the activist role, a lot of people who are activists, like they kind of shirk you family and they just become full-time activists. So I think that's a big motivator in this as well. But regardless, that's the video. Give a like and a subscribe. Also, sorry it's been a while. I've been trying to get this done for months. Just stuff came up. Gonna try to do other topics soon. So peace.